Uh, I'm Andy Cobley from the University of Dundee School of Computing. Uh, apologies if my voice suddenly goes, it seems to be coming and going at the moment. Um, like you, this is my subject. <laughs> I'm uh, actually the programme director for the data science and the data engineering MSCs. University will shoot me if I do not say at this point that we have fully funded places on the MSC, should anyone be interested. I've used that line to get into California, so I think it's probably <laughs> fairly reasonable <laughs> to use it again. Okay, so what I want to talk about is I'm going to talk about um, blockchain, which has been called the most significant technology to come around uh, for quite a number of years. Um, it has the potential, shall we say, to change just about everything we do and the way we do things. I say it's the potential. Nobody seems to have quite got it to work. They're getting there, but nobody's actually managed to make it entirely successful. So, what is blockchain? Um, essentially, I come from the database world, so this is the way I look at it. It's essentially a distributed data da database that contains an ordered list of records. This list of records goes right the way back to the start of the chain. Um, what's really important is this second point in many ways. It's highly resistant to change. Once something goes into this list of records, it's very difficult to make it change, uh, make it different. In the database world, we call this a, uh, an immutable data store. <coughs> The data in there is immutable, can't be deleted. That actually makes it incredibly useful. So, imagine I'm a company uh, and I have a web page that allows people to write things on the web on their wall. They can become friends with other people. Imagine it. You know. <laughs> It'd never work. Never make it work. Um, normally, what people might be interested in is how many friends have I got at this particular point in time. And what you'd normally do is you'd save that in an aggregated store, which would just be like, I have 26 friends, I've got 36 friends. That's really not very useful to tell you how many friends you've got at the moment. If instead you store the events, this person is added as a friend, this per other person's added as a friend, this happened in May, this has happened in June, this person fell out with that person and now no longer a friend. What you can do is a lot more. Instead of saying I've got 26 friends, you can say, <coughs> Ah, my friend count produces a nice little graph. And then you can aggregate that over everybody and say, look, all of a sudden in, in the month of May of 2013, lots of people got lots of friends. You can start to do proper analysis. And that's why it's called a mutable data store because we never change it. We just change, we keep those facts all in a row. One of the reasons that this is important is, uh, is that um, this data store is, is, is managed by a peer-to-peer -peer network. There is no one single copy. That's one of the reasons it's highly um, resistant to change. You can't suddenly just go in there, like you can go into a normal database, change a record, because you can't change the record on all of the, all the different stores all over the world. And every block adds on top of the previous blocks so that um, you can confirm the integrity of the entire data store as it goes along. So you can see the entire back history and you can't change it so you can confirm that this person gave this person this thing or that person gave that person that thing. It's there and it's there forever. Okay, so what's wrong with a central data store? This is a distributed data store. We've been used to central data stores for a very long time. Um, every single bank's got a collection of data stores. Every university, you've all got collections of data stores on your, on your, on your laptops and what have you. So here's some typical faults. Uh, anyone might remember this 2012. Um, the RBS computer system uh, went down. Nobody could get money out of their ATMs. Um, this was all caused by a single piece of software that ran on 1970s, 1980s mainframes. It meant that the, uh, the transactions for that day, in other words, the, the, the things that had happened in the bank, you know, when you go and put money in, surprisingly, when you put money in the bank, it doesn't go straight in, it takes quite a while to go in, um, they didn't happen. And therefore, once that didn't happen, a whole chain of events stopped, stopped working. RBS was fined 56 million pounds in this instance, um, just because people couldn't get money out of their ATMs. Um, 
the software, by the way, uh, it was a very old piece of software. It had been through a number of different companies before uh, eventually ending up on a company called uh, Computer Associates. It was written in the old technology, and very few people actually knew how to fix it. So this is why they couldn't just get somebody in. They had to dial somebody in, a, in India and wait for them to wake up before they could get it to work. And by that time, it had been a cascade event. Security. You work in security. <laughs> Are databases secure? No. Sure. <laughs> they're not secure. How many salesmen are not. <laughs> <laughs> How many data exploits are there in typically for a database? Loads, aren't there? The, the, you know, the most common ones are things that we call SQL injection um, or a, a cross-site injection, that sort of thing, which essentially allows <coughs> people to work their way into that database, <coughs> extract all the data they want to, and it's really not that hard. You can do it with a very simple bits of software. It's an absolute wonder that people are still creating bits of software that is uh, that are open to this um, uh, fault. The talk talk hack was that. Talk so talk was that, was that. Yeah. Oh, you, there's been so many of you. Just, you just can't, you can't keep count. Um, Databases are not secure also because the people who write databases, they're very bad at making mistakes. Um, uh, I have a thing about a language called PHP, which lots of people think is great, but one of the reasons it's not so great is that there are hundreds of examples on there on how to use a database, and inevitably those examples online tell you to do it the wrong way. And so people take these examples, they're wide open to this SQL injection, bad idea. Um, this immutable data store that we have in uh, blockchain essentially means that um, uh, the data can't be changed. Maybe people can take copies of it, but you can't change it. And that's the really dangerous thing, especially in, in, in uh, um, banking or whatever. You, know, you wouldn't be very happy if you woke up tomorrow and found that your bank account was empty. All of a sudden, your money had all gone. OK, so does anyone know what these are? I'm going to give them out to people. You can have one. Characters. You can have one. Anyone else want one? They're really, really cheap. So, I don't know how many they are. Oh, you can have one, are you? Oh, I'll give you the special ones. Okay. Special one. I really don't want one. Thank you. Oh, my God. Okay, so they are trading cards. Uh, physical, uh, phys physical items. Keep them. Yep, keep them. Now I've given them to them, given them to you. I can't give them to anyone else. <laughs> That's it. They're gone. They're gone. They, I could, I could have taken photocopies of them and then tried to pass them off as the real thing. And photocopies can quite get, get, get quite good, but it's still not quite the real thing. <coughs> this is called a double spending problem in the real world. If it, these are things are digital. There's no way to confirm that what I've given you is the original thing. And you might think that that's not very important, except for this. This is a company called Tops. They, uh, there's a Tops card you've got out. They have an online uh, platform for tra uh, dealing in um, digital trading cards. Uh, some of these trading cards, I believe, go for thousands of pounds, the digital ones. It's ridiculous. Um, how are you going to stop people going into the database and taking copies and what have you? Well, blockchain is an, is an answer here because we can, we, we can now record the fact that I've given you that digital item, if I've given you the digital item. I don't need uh, a physical thing to give. I've got that, rec got that record in the blockchain. Um, okay, so Bitcoin, uh, digital currencies are based on uh, blockchain, based on the first blockchain. This uh, distributed ledger is currently 100 gigabytes big and growing all the time. Um, I'm going to run through some ideas that, uh, that have come up um, in the past. We're now moving on to something called blockchain 2, which makes it possible to store an individual's uh, persistent digital ID. So, as people, we leak data all the time, that's what we do. If you think about your Tesco card, you think your Tesco card is there to give you Tesco points. It's not. It's there for, for Tesco to know what you buy, when you buy it, every single event, 
that happens at the till is recorded by that Tesco card and they can use it and they will sell that data to companies as well. And companies, there are companies out there that, will, are, who, that deal only in data. So for instance, um, um, another company that deals in, 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 in uh, washing powder data of all things. And a company will come to them and say, we're going to do a deal with Tesco to put the washing powder at the front of the store on use washing powder and see if we can sell more. But Tesco won't actually sell us the data to sell us more. But this company, the intermediates, have that data from Tesco so they can do the analysis and then sell it to the washing powder people. They're not selling anything but the data and the analysis of that data. Um, one of the great things about blockchain is it now makes it possible for you to own the data for yourself, of, about yourself. So it's possible that we could all go out there and start selling data about ourselves to Tesco rather than Tesco owning it if we wanted to. Um, we've already touched on this uh, in terms of the TOPS card. Um, a lady called Image and Heath um, puts her music on blockchain. Uh, that allows her to set up a smart contract intellectual property rights. Um, what that means is that if you want to listen to the music, you will pay a fraction of a penny. If you want to use her music in a Hollywood blockbuster, the contract says that you'll pay a lot more for that. If you want to use a music in a musical um, uh, Christmas card or whatever, then it may say you can't do that because it's too tacky and we're not allowing it. <laughs> um, but the point is that this is tracking her, her intellectual property. Um, land ownership is a major deal. Uh, in, in this country, we're really quite uh, <coughs> lucky in that uh, okay lawyers are involved and what have you but in general we know who owns what bit of land other parts of the country the world this isn't true um in honduras uh, a number of years ago the database of who owned what was hacked uh bureaucrats managed to get into this database and started to take the rights to beachfront properties they then owned it um they came up with the idea that they could use a blockchain solution to prove who owned what. It's really a really good, uh, smart contract in many ways. Um, and this was going to fix everything, but last we heard that this project had stalled and presumably Honduras is in the uh, same position it is now. One thing that's, that, that is interesting, we're talking about Honduras, we think that's a long way away. In Spain, there are similar situations with people who, who think that they bought um, land to build, to build their holiday homes on. With the coming events of Brexit, they may suddenly find they don't own those homes anymore. There's already been disputes over who owns what bit of land in Spain. So maybe something like blockchain could fix this. Um, <coughs> again, because we tend to live in a really uh, uh, affluent country, we don't really normally do this, but um, in countries that have a lot of people that come in and work part-time in very um, badly paid jobs, and I see this with students in Dundee actually, so students that have come from India and what have you, they'll take a part-time job and then, then ship that money back home. Um, it's worth an estimated $600 billion worldwide just shipping money from one place to, a lot, and to another. And everybody who ships money home has to pay Union, Western, or whatever, a fair amount of money to do that. Um, <coughs> there's a solution um, out there, um, I can't remember the name of it, that allows you to send money by blockchain. What happens is that a broker in the local country then will have a look at the blockchain. The great thing is because it's on blockchain, his reputation is on the blockchain as well, so you know you can trust him. And he gives you the money in the local currency and takes a very small percentage, you're not paying Union Western or whatever it is, large amounts of money. Blockchain is about one thing. It's about being able to distribute your rights and use your rights um, uh, internationally and globally. There's an uh, alternative to Airbnb. It's uh, Airbnb for Airbnb or something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this, again, all the properties are on blockchain, it gives shared ownership, it's not a central company like Airbnb with their central database. Everybody involved in it's got a copy of their database and everything they do is on there. It um, builds this sharing eco um, economy. 
more importantly, the reviews of a place can't be hacked or changed because they're on this immutable store. And whoever makes the review, you can prove who did it. One of the bad things about uh, um, things like TripAdvisor and what have you is that you know, hotels can pay people to put good reviews into TripAdvisor and what have you. With this, we can prove them, uh, who, who actually did it on the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> voting systems. Uh, we all know that we go into a, into a booth, you put a little X on it, and it's very bad for democracy because lots of people don't want to go out when it's raining, so you get a low turnout. If you can do an electronic uh, version of voting and prove that the person you voted voted, and that person can, they can verify that the, at any point in time that the vote that they've cast hasn't been changed, then we might be able to get more people out there to actually vote. And there is a system out there using blockchain. You can see it. It's called followmyvote.com. Um, I actually don't know how successful it is, but they will uh, deal. They will um, set up online voting for you. You get an ID from the government that proves who you are and everything. And hopefully, you can then look at your vote and verify that you voted at any point. So, hopefully, blockchain is going to start. Um, making more people vote. So that's five or six <coughs> different ideas for you. Um, I haven't introduced the technology of blockchain because to be honest with you, um, it's like anything else. You don't need to know exactly what happens inside there to use it, to innovate with it. You know, I don't know how, how, how a microprocessor in my Mac works, but I can program it damn well. I don't need to know how the microprocessor works to be able to do that. And you don't need to know the ins and outs of how blockchain works, the mathematics, because it's fairly fierce math mathematics, <laughs> and I don't want to understand it either. <laughs> okay, uh, that's me, Andy Cobley. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you want to. I'm quite happy to uh, answer questions. Um, I have to put these here, as I said at the beginning, you know, it pays me, and it pays me to, 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 to say data engineering and data science NSC is currently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.